and I love that about this scripture. Uh, the Word of God tells us that you and I, as believers, are to be discerning of times. First Chronicles 12, 32, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the time, to know what Israel ought to do. So it's important that you and I understand the times. The church, we are called to know the times. We're called to discern the times and to know the seasons. So it's very important that we come together today and we learn about <laughs> we learn about what the scripture points to in end time theology. Um, a lot of churches don't preach or teach on it. It's a, it's a topic that is avoided, although it's one-fourth of the Bible. And we're living exactly what Jesus taught the disciples about. So it's vital that we have the understanding. As a matter of fact, Jesus scolded his disciples because they did not discern the season and the time. Um, technically, we're in the last day. We are not in the end times. And I want to give that differentiation to you. Um, technically, the last days is considered to be the church age, which is what we are in right now. And the church age will end when the last soul comes into the kingdom. That's when the church age actually ends. We're in what Jesus calls right now as the beginning of sorrow. The rapture of the church is going to occur. That's the very next thing that occurs on the um, God's time clock. And then the end times uh, will, will technically begin with the seven-year tribulation period. Okay. We just hit the 70-year uh, mark since the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Seventy years to the day from the rebirth, Jerusalem, is declared the capital. And I don't know if you realize the significance of that, but God is into numbers. <laughs> so 70 years to the day. We have a biblical roadmap of what's coming next. And um, when we look at Daniel, it shows us with great clarity. So we want to uh, understand what, da what Daniel was telling us. Uh, Daniel, if you remember what I said last time we were together, chapters 1 through 6 is history with a little bit of prophecy sprinkled in. Chapters 6 through 12 is prophecy with a little bit of history uh, sprinkled in. It's important to understand the structure of the book so you can get the big picture, okay? So if we want to know what's happening in our world today and where we're headed, the book of Daniel will give us great insight. Now remember, it, when we look at the past, we look at it so that we can understand the future. We see God's pattern throughout history. And God is a God of pattern. And I want to give you an example. When a nation falls into idolatry and turns from the uh, acknowledgement of God, God will turn that nation over into the hand of the enemy. And you see that repeated throughout Scripture over and over again. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's important that we understand. When a nation falls into spiritual apathy, spiritual apathy leads to a spiritual apostasy. Where are we now, church? <laughs> spiritual apostasy leads to anarchy. And anarchy always leads to bondage, captivity. Okay, Jeremiah prophesied in Jeremiah 24, 20 verse 4, the captivity of Babylon, that um, Israel under the captivity of Nebuchadnezzar. So if you want to write that down, remember that. Jeremiah 20 verse 4 is where Jeremiah prophesied the captivity of Israel under Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was taken um, into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar besieged the city of Jerusalem in 605 BC. He was the first group deported. Uh, the Babylonian um, captors took 70 
of the most brilliant young minds that they could find in Israel. Daniel writes over 70 years of his life in captivity. Babylon, which you need to know, is a symbol of evil. And we're going to talk about that tonight because I want you to get the picture of what Babylon actually represents. It's a wicked world system that is anti-God and anti-Christ. And if you look at our world today, it doesn't take much to see the direction we're headed in, right? It is written. It's already written. Okay, who was Daniel? Again, we're not going to go line by line, verse by verse, but we are going to talk about who Daniel was. Daniel was a man who did not compromise. Critical, unlike Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and David. He never, Daniel, never had a bad word written about him. Nowhere in scripture will you find that. We learn from the character of Daniel. And that this is, this is how we learn how to function in a godless society. We learn that he acknowledged and honored God in all things. We learn that he refused to accept status quo. We learn that he decided from the very beginning, I will not defile myself. That's powerful. We learn that he refused compromise. And I want you to think about you and I, where we are in our society. Uh, do we have that same demeanor? Are we willing not to compromise, although it might cost us something? We all have friends that don't agree with the way we believe. We, we watch evil in our families. We're inundated with it through the television, the newscast. Can we make a decision to refuse to allow the culture to defile and define us? Okay, so I want to give a quick synopsis of Daniel 1. Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem, takes it over. He gives a, the order to take the best youth of the land, to teach them in literature and language. He appoints them for a daily ration of the king's finest wine, the best foods. They were to be educated for three years. And then if they passed their test, they would, they would go on into personal service for the king. The king's servants were to assign the Hebrew men new names. Now, why did they do that? They did that to change their identity. This is critical. They wanted to alter the men's character. They wanted to indoctrinate them. They wanted them to assimilate into a pagan society. They wanted to strip away their past and to give them a new future. We see that right now on college campuses across our country. Assimilation and indoctrination. Okay, that loss of tradition causes confusion. It causes them to disconnect from their family heritage. Okay, then we go on to see they had name changes. Daniel, if you remember from the last time we were together, means God is my judge. And we talked a little bit about that. I would rather have no other judge, uh, judge than God alone, right? Okay, his name was cha changed to Belshazzar, which means Baal's prince, prince of Baal, or Baal protects the king. Uh, Hananiah which meant beloved of the Lord, was chain, ch changed to Shadrach, which means illuminate, illuminated by the sun god. Excuse me, I'm going to get these words out. <laughs> and then Michelle, who, was, who is as God, is changed to Meshach, who is like Venus. So you can see very quickly... Um, as a Raya, the Lord is my help, is chained, uh, changed to servant of Nego. So we can see very quickly that they, as soon as those guys got there, there was an effort to strip their past from them, strip who they were, strip their identity. 
And the way they did that was name changes and inundation into the culture. We see God does name changes. Abram to Abraham, uh, Sarai to Sarah, uh, Jacob to Israel, Simon to Peter, Naomi to Mara was her own name change, self-appointed. But you and I get a new name, right? We get a new name in, in the... Uh, happens when we get there. Satan gives names to change identity, okay? So we go on and look at the scripture. God granted Daniel favor and compassion. Important to know, God is sovereign. And what you will see through Daniel 1 is a very clear picture how God played the part and role in all things that were going forth. Okay, God handed them over. And sometimes we don't like to hear that in church. We want to hear just the good things. <laughs> but when we look at the way the scripture is written, it gives us a very clear picture of God handing them over and the reason he handed them over. Okay, then Daniel requests a, a time, a period of testing because he did not want to eat from the king's food. So they tested the Hebrew man, men. They were given water and vegetables for 10 days. And the, what happened to the Hebrew boys, they were stronger, fatter, and healthier than ever before. The king talks to them, and he sees they are, there is none like them in all of their kingdom. So, so he acknowledged the giftedness in these Hebrew men. God gave them knowledge and intelligence. The word says in every branch of literature and learning. So they were able to comprehend. They were able to learn quickly. The word of God says that Daniel had um, an understanding of visions and dreams. Uh, so we're going to see him uh, throughout this time period. Not only is he a seer, but he's also an, an interpreter of, of dreams. So the, the king took advantage of the giftedness that God put in Daniel. He recognized it quickly, and he took advantage of the gifts. Very important. So what did Daniel do? He acknowledged God and honored God in everything. He refused status quo. He decided not to compromise at the very beginning. Daniel was in a world that hated God and defied God. So I want you to get this picture. Why? Because our world is moving in this direction, whether we like it or not, and we know for certain because it, again, is written. Okay? Okay, he was under pagan rule. He was under an evil dictatorship. He was being forced to assimilate. He was being forced, or they tried to force him to worship their false gods, but he refused. His culture... I want you to think about this, was full of idolatry and paganism. That's the world that he was introduced to. That's the world he lived in for 70 years. I don't know about you, but this gives me hope. Friends, we can do it, right? We can, if Daniel could do it, we can do it. Okay, so we see this culture was filled with sexual perversion. It was filled with indulgence. They had everything. So indulgence was commonplace for, for Daniel's, um, uh, the culture that he was in. Okay, so that's a synopsis of Daniel 1. Now what I want us to look at tonight is Babylon gives us the picture of a one world government that is coming. And I want you to hear me. It's a, it's a symbol and representation of a one world government. And so when you look at Babylon, Babylon was a ruling dominant empire that craved world dominance. That's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted. He wanted to rule the world. He was willing to do whatever it took to get that. It was a system that was inundated with false worship. It was perversion of every kind. So what does the Bible have to say about Babylon? We're going to look, first of all, Babylon under Nimrod. Then we're going to look at Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. And then we're going to look at 
Babylon under the Antichrist, which is Mystery Babylon. Babylon starts with the Tower of Babel, and it continues through Daniel's life, the 70 years in captivity, and then it ends with Mystery Babylon. So I want you to get that whole scenario. If you get that picture in your mind, you start to develop an understanding of what it means for a one-world government. Very critical. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he, his desire was for a centralized government that would rule the world. Um, so it's a perfect backdrop to understand what the one world government will look like and what it looks like today. Okay? Babylon, where is it located? It was located in modern Iraq today, which is located on the Euphrates River. It's between two waters, the Euphrates. Euphrates River and the Tigris River. It's about 55 miles south of Baghdad, uh, Iraq. So if you want to kind of get that in your mind, um, we'll have maps. We'll have maps printed out for ladies who are like me. <laughs> you need the visuals. <laughs> okay, Babylon and Assyria were considered the first world powers. Babylon was the largest, greatest, most powerful, and most wicked of all the ancient world. Okay, it's the first city to reach 200,000 citizens. Now, back in ancient days, I don't know if you can grasp that in your mind, that is a massive, massive city, okay? The name Babylon came from Tower of Babel because it was constructed there. Babylon means gate of God. Ironically, as you go into Babylon, there was a beautiful gate which has um, been reconstructed. It's in the uh, Pergamon Museum in Berlin today. You can see it. But it was a, a gate to Ishtar because that was one of the goddesses that they worshipped. So Babylon was um, famous for impenetrable walls. In other words, it had the thickest walls around them, so thick that chariots actually raced on top of the walls. So they were into security. <laughs> um, the walls uh, in the city, if you think about the city inside the walls, the city was 200 square miles, which is roughly the size of Chicago today. So that'll give you another visual of how big, how massive this place was. They were not playing around, right? <laughs> um, so I want to I want to explain the law of first mention. I don't know if you've heard about the law of first mention, but to understand a particular word or a doctrine or a theory, you want to go back to the first place in the Bible that it's mentioned. If you go back. The reasoning is, if you go back to the first place it's mentioned, you're going to find the simplest explanation of that word and build the theory or the doctrine from that uh, foundation. Okay, so that's the law of first mention. So we're going to look at the Tower of Babel. Babel means confusion. That's the first it's mentioned. It's, it means confusion, and it is the root word to Babylon. The Tower of Babel was a place, a high place of worship. Um, it was the beginning of Nimrod's uh, kingdom. There have been articles written that says they have found the foundation in excavation uh, there in Iraq. He built uh, Babel after the flood. He was a, grand, a great grandson of Noah through the line of Ham and Cush, if you remember back in Genesis. And this is what Genesis 11 says, 11.4. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heaven and make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad all over the face of the earth. Now, I want you to think about that just a minute. That is Genesis 11. These men, under the leadership of, of Nim, Nimrod, they tried to build a tower to reach to the heavens, but their goal was to leave God out, okay? Man's still trying. 
They're still trying to get to heaven every way except the only one way, right? Through Jesus Christ. Okay, so their thoughts were, we don't need you, God. So, so what, what did God say? God said in Genesis 1, he says, go forth and multiply and, and take dominion over all of the earth. So we know from the very beginning in Genesis that God's plan was for man to divide, separate, and conquer all of the earth. Nimrod's ma uh, method, Nimrod's goal was to get all men under him. Okay? Uh, a side note. There is transhumanists now who believe they can upload your brain into the internet so that you can live forever. So there, <laughs> there is so much talk in the secular world because people don't want to die and be the end, but they don't want to serve God and know that's really the beginning, right? For us, it's joyous beginning. Okay. So, so God stepped in because he wanted to prevent the human race from falling under the tyrancy of one wicked ruler. He saw the city. He saw their goals. He saw their idolatry. He saw their perversion. And he said, you know, if they all come together, they might be able to accomplish what they're trying to do. <laughs> so... Nimrod. Who was Nimrod? I said before, he was the great-grandson of Noah. But he was a man of defiance. His own name means rebel. So that should tell you something about him. He was called a mighty hunter. But if you read the scripture, actually the meaning behind that, he wasn't hunting animal. He was hunting men because he wanted to rule over them. And it was more or less like he was a man of blood, so he did not care the cost. Um, it, you could read it like it's he's a mighty hunter, not for God, but in the face of God. In other words, I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what you told me to do. So you can see a, rebel, a rebellious man and what he was willing to do. Nimrod was the king of Babylon. And king of Babylon is also a term used for the Antichrist. So just like Babylon is a picture of mystery Babylon, Nimrod is a symbol of the Antichrist to come, a ruthless, evil, wicked man out for world domination. Now today, I want you to think about this because we see there is a, a pressing into globalism. And I'm going to talk about that tonight because globalism sounds wonderful on the surface. But if you dig deep, you will be astounded of what it means in your life. Um, when COVID came along, I, I, I don't know how, but God led me to understand the Great Reset. And when I heard and understood about, I started studying the Great Reset before ever the term was even used. And... Uh, <laughs> They said, you will have nothing and be happy about it. And I thought, this might be a problem. <laughs> okay, so Nimrod is a type of Antichrist. Antichrist, what does that word mean? I want you to understand, it's opposed to Christ, it's against Christ, but it can also be instead of Christ. Now, you all know, because scripture clearly tells us that there are now in the world many, many antichrists, right? So there's not just one, there's many. Uh, 1 John 2, 18, children, it's the last hour. And just as you heard, antichrist is coming. Even now, many antichrists have appeared. From this, we know that it is the last hour. Okay, so we see that there is a... Um, a desire, a pressure to push aside Jesus Christ. I think about Facebook when I try to uh, a certain posts that I would use the name of Jesus and for, for a, a long period of time 
they would say that my posts were hate speech even though my posts were about Jesus and his love <laughs> so I I couldn't get any I couldn't get any um, I couldn't get my posts out for quite a while um, things have changed a little bit but there's they're, they're still playing a lot of games with Christian uh, information second John 7 for many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist so we see the definition there if someone says Jesus did not come in the flesh that's an Antichrist spirit okay so Nimrod gives us a picture of not an Antichrist but the Antichrist so I want you to get that in your head um, Nimrod was into false worship after his death he and his wife were actually deified as um, Assyrian gods Marduk and Astarte and I hope I'm pronouncing that right so so they were exalted and deified in the eyes of the people uh, so you can quickly see the damage that had been done one world government where do you find that people are going to want to know and you should be you should be able to go to the scripture quickly and you should be able to discern where it is uh, revelation 13 gives insight into the one world government a one world go government is dangers of absolute power deception erosion of freedom inability to worship the one and true god um, so th this is uh, absolute power now I'm going to show you where I get that in just a minute but in Revelation 13 you will see in 13 7 a one world leader Revelation 13 7 this is in your handout so if you know you don't have to write all these down but at least you can turn there authority was given him over every tribe tongue and nation that's a leader over the entire world okay one world government all the world marveled and gave allegiance gave their allegiance to the beast in other words they gave him the authority to rule one world religion so they worship that's 13 4 revelation 13 4 so they worship the dragon who gave them authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast so we can see a one world religion where the Antichrist will be worshipped okay in 13 uh, 16 we see a one world economy and I, I'm giving you this because again I want you to get the picture of this one world um, one world government what all it entails a one world economy receive the mark on the right hand or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark and I know, you know, there's been so much talk, talk, and we talked a little bit about that last time. What is the mark? What is the mark? The, the, the 666 is the number of the beast. It's not the name of the beast, okay? It's the number. And so we don't know, but what we do know for sure, it's going to be on our hand, our right hand, or our forehead. And then we see an uh, one world military. And that's who is able to make um, able to make war with him so so that gives you basically in a nutshell the entire vision of how the world would run under a, a tyrannical leader a one world leader okay so globalism sounds great you'll hear words like this equality prosperity uh, wealth transfer you'll hear words like freedom and and um, social justice and we can we can look at the surface and think well that all sounds beautiful but then you have to look and have um, a critical thinking in other words you can't take things at the surface level you have to dig deep and you have to understand what they're actually telling you you're going to get that's why end time studies eschatology is critical 
Because if you don't know what's coming, you could be one of those that are deceived. Okay, so the appeal of the new world order lies with the its proposal of free war, um, a free world, free of war, free of political strife. It promises to eradicate poverty and disease and hunger, to meet all the needs and hopes of mankind through world peace. Now, I want you to hear me. To get us in that direction, to move us toward a one world government, what they need is a major crisis, a major crisis. If we look at COVID, that was the start. I want you to think about that, how everybody just immediately gave away their their critical thinking and just followed blindly like sheep and listened to everything they told you to do. That's a sample, a small sample of what's going to come. And if you think about that, it's not going to take much. They've already talked about the next pandemic. There's plans in the works. Uh, We're talking about alien invasions. (laughs) And, you know, three years ago, two years ago, we would have mocked that. We have politicians that have gotten on television and said, this stuff is real and it's coming. Now, you know, I mean, I can explain it through biblical, but (laughs) that's a whole whole different lesson. (laughs) We won't go there tonight. Okay, why is God opposed to it? Why is God opposed to a one world system? Because he wants man to rely on him. He wants man to be free to worship him, not to be told. See, that's the difference between God and the devil. God wants to give you free will. The devil wants to steal your free will. Because when you're in bondage to the devil, you're no longer a free person. If you're in bondage or enslaved to a one world government, you are no longer a free person. Okay, so... Um, our world has tried to build our own Babel, uh, Tower of Babel. I don't know if you remember this, but George Bush Sr. used to mention in his speeches, there's a new world order coming. I checked it out myself. I remembered it, but I went back and found it on YouTube too, where he actually said that in several of his speeches. It's been referred to almost by every president for the last hundred years except our previous president before this one. Uh, It's been, it has been mentioned by nearly every pope and most of the world leaders that there is a new world order coming. Okay, I want to show you some things that might help you along on that idea. There's a fund now called the New World Monument Fund. It's for the rebuilding of Babylon by the help of your taxpaying dollar and mine. In 1983, Saddam Hussein imagined himself to be an heir to Nebuchadnezzar, and he started the building process of Babylon to to rebuild Babylon. It's, It's now halted, but who's to say, you know, that we might move forward with that again. There's a one world unity under United Nations currently. There's a one world economy under World Economy Forum, Economic Forum. I don't know if you've heard of these. Um, That's where you get the Great Reset. That's where you get people saying you will own nothing and be happy with it. (laughs) The one world church. There's a world council of churches There's a one world religion headquarters already now. It's also called the um, Abrahamic Family House in um, Abu Dubai, which is the capital of the United Arab uh, uh, Immigrants, Emirates. So it was built by Pope Francis and by the Sheik, I'm not gonna say his name, by Sheik, he's a Sunni, a Sunni Muslim leader. Okay, so that's already in the works. The United Nations, World Economic Forum, World Council on Churches, World Religious Headquarters, 
So we can see right now there is a thrust and a desire across the world for a one world established government. This is promised in the end. How close church are we right now? We talked about Gog and Magog the last time and how close we are to that situation. When Russia enters into Israel, you might as well look up. And I mean look up. <laughs> Your redemption draweth nigh, right? So, so we need to understand these things. The deception and sellability of a one world government is astounding. So I wrote some slogans down. Uh, the World Council of Churches says this, inspiring worldwide fellowship of churches to work together for unity, justice, and peace. And I want you to know clearly, the Bible is very clear. We do not mix religions, right? When you mix, take a religion and you mix a little of another religion, neither religion is pure. They've both been compromised. Okay, so dangers of one world government. I want you to look at China because it's another perfect example. Human rights violations, totalitarianism, uh, strict adherence to rules and ideas that they determine what you think, where you go, what you do. They seek to control every step of your, uh, that you take. You are not free in speech. You are not free to worship. A couple of years ago, I had an option to go to, um, it was, was it, I forget, it was in China. I forget um, now where, but it was the biggest paycheck I would have ever gotten in my life. <laughs> and I wanted to go. It was two hours of work. They were going to fly five people, five, um, first class for uh, seven days and I had to work two hours. And I prayed about it, and God said, no. <laughs> and then I learned, you're not free. You can't just say what you want to say. You can't do what you just want to do. And so we have to understand that this is an example on a small scale of what the one world end times government will look like. We're already on the process. And what that should say to you and I, time is short, right? This is a, a ministering tool. It's an evangelistic tool. Because if people really understood how close we are, it would blow their mind. So we see these things happening. Okay, in eschatology, I want to show you two cities. Uh, the first is Jerusalem, which is God's holy city. It's described as the virtuous bride in Revelation. It's going to be the world capital during the millennial reign of Christ, which we will go over in this, in this class. Um, but compare that with Babylon, a wicked earthly city. It's sometimes described as the devil's capital city. Um, Isaiah prophesied its fall, and this is amazing to me, two centuries before the fall of Babylon. And if you took every prophecy that's already been accomplished hundreds of years before it actually occurred with such um, clarity, um, it, it, it just is miraculous. It's, it's just miraculous. And, and some, of these, some of these texts were not found, you know, they were found from very early on and so you know the the skeptics say oh it can't be true because the bible can't prophesy that can't see in the future but we have it already written if half of the predictions that have been written have already come true what do you think about the last half i mean it's a promise it's a guarantee it shouldn't even be a thought on our mind. God will accomplish what he said he would accomplish. Okay, so this, this world system that we're looking at, Babylon, um, 
Satan's kingdom versus God's kingdom. And that's when you hear globalism, you ought to, right away, you should say, hmm, that, that's, not, that's not what I want. It sounds good. It looks good. It seems to answer all, you know, all the questions. But when you get down to it, it's about manipulation and control and domination. Okay. <laughs> Satan's kingdom is about self-exaltation. Okay. And you see that now and you see that then, what was written. There was an exaltation. It was a seduction of the masses. In other words, with pleasure, with goods, with ease, with peace, with security. That's the temptation. That's what they're going to tell you you're going to get. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. It enslaves people to follow it. So in other words, Satan's kingdom will enslave people to follow it. Now you think, well, you know, that's later. That doesn't affect me. Look, if you've got a teenage girl in your household... And she went to the last concert of Taylor Swift. You better be praying for that girl. Because Taylor Swift was on a stage dressed in black, surrounded by, uh, dressed in red, surrounded by black. It was like a satanic ritual in which people who were there, who attended the, uh, the, the uh, concert, literally had hypnosis and did not, could not remember being there. I don't know if you've read about that, but it made major news because people could not remember being there. So if you look at this as like, oh, well, it's in the distant future. Friends, it's here now. It's already here. So it seduces the masses. It uh, persecutes those who resist it. So in other words, if you stand against the culture, you're going to come up against persecution. And we don't know persecution in America. We have the freedom to say the name of Jesus. We're learning about persecution because it's on the rise. And there's been, there's been um, an onslaught of attack against the religious voice and I've been guilty of this. Sit down and shut up. Right? Just, I don't want to hear it. And what we have to do is we have to defy those voices that try to silence. Oh, thank you. Silence us. Okay, so this a satanic culture is filled with pride, with violence, with greed, with immorality, with falsehood, with deceit with self-centeredness, with um, false religion. And I want you again to think about where we are as a nation today when you have half of denominational churches teaching apostasy. Okay, so that, that's, that's crazy. Satan's kingdom wants to assimilate you. Okay, Mystery Babylon. We're going to move on to Mystery Babylon. We can see the dangers here, right? We can see the progression here. Mystery Babylon is prophetic Babylon. It's a rebellion against God. Mystery Babylon is the battle of light and dark. And what I want you to know, it's both a city and a system. So don't let people confuse you. It is both a city and a system. It's a literal city. Um, the Word of God, Revelation 17, 18. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over kings of the earth. I'm not going to have time tonight to go into all the different theories about what city and what kingdoms will follow after um, Mystery ba Babylon. But what we will know is most of the world will follow. There's, there's talk, well, is it, is it the United States? Is it New York? Is it uh, Rome? Is it uh, the Vatican? Those are just a few things that get thrown out there, what Mystery Babylon could be. I don't know if you know this, but in America, your country 
sends out more pornography than any country in the entire world. And I don't know about you, but just this week I've ministered to two beautiful women separately, both who are going through divorces, who have small children, where their husbands are addicted to pornography and sexual immorality because of the pornography. pornography. So do you think it's a problem? Mystery Babylon, who knows? What we do know is it's, it is a city that fills the earth, the entire earth, with sexual immorality and wickedness. We know that. Okay. Mystery Babylon is the center of global and economic power. It's a superpower city. And so sometimes you do think of New York because of all of the uh, income of the world. You look at the world and, and everything goes through New York. You know, all the financial systems that are there and how it touches every country in the world. So a mystery Babylon is a, a city that persecutes the believer, okay? I was reading recently on some statistics, and I think it was several, several um, states, like Maine, I, I forget them all, but there, was, there were like five states that have less than 20% church attendance, less than 20%. In our, in our country. Okay, so uh, Babylon describes a woman who is the great harlot with whom the kings of the earth commit fornication. So what we know, it's going to be a center of world religion. It's going to be a center of global and economic superpowers. It's going to be a city and a system that persecutes the believers. It's going to be a city and a system that touches every aspect of the entire world. A powerful, powerful system. One world government and mystery Babylon. So we need to look at what we can glean from Daniel's time. And I've got uh, the second handout that you're going to look at. And I'm going to run through this very quickly, but I want you to turn to that handout about mystery Babylon just to give you an idea. It's described as the great city with worldwide influence. That's number one. It's described as associated with the corruption of kings and political powers. That's number two. Number three, it's characterized by spiritual deception and false religious practices. Uh, Four, it is a place of immense wealth and material abundance. Five, it's described as the center of trade and commerce. Six, it is responsible for the shedding of blood of God's people and prophets. Number seven, it is the source of seduction and temptation for the nations. And you see the scriptures all right below each point. Mystery Babylon is associated with idolatry and for, um, the worship of false gods. Number nine, it's designated for judgment and destruction, and we said that before, and this specifically is talking about mystery Babylon. So we saw in Scripture Isaiah prophesy two hundred centuries before, two centuries before the fall of Babylon, and now we see in Revelation the fall of mystery Babylon. In other words, what you and I need to know: in the end, we win. Mystery Babylon is described as a city reigning over the kings of the earth. And 12, it's a place where false teachings and doctrines are um, uh, propagated. So, So here's what you need to know. Oh, well, and 13, associated with economic dominance and influence. And it's described as a city that sits on many waters, representing and symbolizing its global reach. Again, that's another reason people sometimes uh, say New York City might be mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon will ultimately face divine judgment and utterly be destroyed. Now here's the thing. Mystery Babylon could also be a group of elite rulers who are making decisions for nations. And if you look at how money rules our world, there are several um, uh, industries or businesses like 
like Elon Musk, like Facebook, they, their uh, uh, GD, GDP, gross income, is more than many nations. Money talks. So if you've ever, just, just for instance on Facebook, if you've ever been shut down, if you've ever been in Facebook jail, if you've ever had blocks and told you can't speak, or if you, all of your posts about God end up at the very end of the feed so nobody sees them, that's just a, just a touch of what we're up against. And this small elite ruling class is already functioning now. We don't know where they are. We don't know necessarily who they are, but what we do know is there's people spending big dollars to um, defile America, to, um, to break America apart, to cause upheaval. And um, we can see how very quickly things could change like that. So being aware of what's coming, we're supposed to be the seers. We're supposed to know what the world does not understand. Okay, so how does the book of Re Revelation assure us of God's ultimate victory over one world government? Revelation reveals that God holds ultimate authority and will bring judgment on the beast and those who worship the beast. And we see that clearly in scripture that he, with the breath of his mouth, will destroy the false prophet and the Antichrist. So God's plan culminates in the second coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his everlasting kingdom. So for a millennial, for a thousand years, you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, we will rule and reign on a literal thousand year rule with Christ Jesus our King and I don't know about you but that gives me great hope it gives me hope to be able to look and see where we are on the timeline and what's coming next and how we prepare ourselves I'm not one of these people that says go and just stick your head in the sand Christian and keep your mouth shut <laughs> I think we're supposed to be light in industry in business uh, in schools in medicine in finance we are supposed to be the light at the ballot box we're supposed to be voting God's principles God's principles and so we know church we know at the end we win do we walk in fear of what's coming? No. Daniel teaches us how to live righteous in an unholy um, uh, system. Okay. So, ultimately, all evil will be judged, and we have that guarantee. I'm going to close this in, in prayer, and then we're going to break up and discuss the questions. Okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, God. We praise you, Father, that you have given us sight. We praise you, God, that you have given us forewarning of what's coming and that you've so carefully laid it out before us, Father, that we can see your handprint on everything that is being done, that nothing, nothing is a mystery to you. We thank you for that. Father, I ask you to bless each and every person here. I ask you, Father, to give them a hunger and a desire to understand your end times theology. God, I ask you to give us the comprehension and the knowledge we need to grasp what you're teaching us even tonight. Be with each and every one of us. Bless these uh, wonderful people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all. I want you to